I'm happy to introduce our last speaker, Timo Weingans from the University of Hamburg. Hello, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. And um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for having me for the kind and generous invitation. I'm very happy to be here, enjoying the interaction. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about um, this um, project, which is kind of a longer program that, as far as my involvement is concerned, started together with uh, Wolfgang Lerche, who is um, with us now online, and from Julie um, at CERN, then now in Korea. And um, I'd like to give an update and the more recent developments in this work with uh, my postdoc, Susan Kota, and Alessandro Mignano in Hamburg, and with Maxime from the And since we are all on a busy schedule and may have to leave soon, I'd like to give a punchline first. And since we are two audiences, one in physics and one in mathematics, I need to give two punchlines. So first to the maybe more mathematically inclined part of the audience, I'd like to argue or give an example of how GV and DT invariants play an important role in physics, not only in general, but in particular in verifying certain physics conjectures about quantum gravity, and especially the tower weak gravity conjecture will be relying on this mathematical um, structure of DT invariants and their products. And this is one example of the many profound implications of this broader program called Swampland program, which makes predictions about quantum gravity from a physics point of view. And to the extent that quantum gravity can be realized in examples by string theory, this makes statements about compact string geometry. And compact is important because this is the relation to the gravitational. So we're not going to talk about non-compact geometries, which are um, relevant for gauge theories, but really the compactness comes from the gravitation. And the punchline for the more physics-oriented part of the um, audience would be that we prove the asymptotic tower with gravity conjecture in 5D n equal 1 m theory compactification. And this is one example of the many well-known to you applications of scalar geometry and also enumerative geometry in physics. So let me introduce the um, key um, object of interest in this talk. It's the weak gravity conjecture. This is well known to the physicists in the room. Um, I'm not sure how well known it is to the mathematicians who haven't followed this. So let me um, remind us all of the statement. It's one of the general statements about what a quantum gravity theory should have, irrespective of whether this theory comes from a string theory or some other theory. And um, according to these authors, Every quantum gravity theory should have the following property. If you have a gauge sector coupled to quantum gravity, so for example, if you one gauge theory or young Mills gauge theory more generally, and I'm, for simplicity, I'm only focusing on the abelian part, and you have a certain charge lattice associated with this gauge theory, so charged object, charged state, or representations of the gauge group, then every ray in the charge lattice must support a tower of super extremal states. That's the claim. I'll define in a second what I mean by this. And the significance is from the physics point of view, this conjecture predicts the existence of certain states with a certain ratio of charge to mass. That's the claim. In every quantum gravity theory, there should be certain states, in fact, infinitely many, with a suitable ratio of charge to mass. You'll be more precise in a second. And from the mathematics point of view, why is this interesting from mathematics? Because we can use string theory to realize quantum gravity theory. At least believe that this is a consistent quantum gravity theory. And then the existence of these states can be translated into a very pre precise statement about the non-vanishing of certain enumerative invariants on compact calabria, which are the compactification states of the string or anchor. So this is the um, logic, and this is, of course, what we'd like to show in the in the text. And I need to be more precise first what is meant by super extremal and what is meant by tower. Super extremal. So this is now uh, the physics motivation, of course, or the physics statements. There are, first of all, two types, two ways of talking about super extremality, and so that we don't confuse, let me um, 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 recall them. So, first of all, super extremal means a particle super extremal. If the ratio of its charge, i.e. the weight of its representation, so to speak, to its mass, is bigger than this ratio of charge to mass of every black hole in the theory. 
So depending on your theory, you have black holes, you can classify the black holes, you compute the charge to mass ratio of these black holes, so these classical solutions of GR. You take the maximal Q to M of the black holes, these are usually the extreme, well, these are the extremal black holes, and you and uh, you say a particle is super extremal if its charge to mass ratio is bigger than charge to mass of every black hole, in particular of the extremal. So there must be particles with this property, that's the prediction from quantum gravity. And another way of phrasing, a related way of phrasing that, and this explains the name weak gravity conjecture, would be giving two particles, so two states of a certain representation of certain weights in a gauge group, then they must be self-repulsive. This means the sum of all the repulsive forces or the repulsive force from um, the gauge group must be bigger than or equal to the attractive forces. And there can be two types of attractive forces, one from gravity, obviously, in quantum gravity, but if there are scalar fields, they can also be, in, in addition, attractive forces circled your carbon. And this would mean that for these particles, gravity, or more precisely, gravity plus your carbon, so everything that is attractive, should be weaker than the repulsive force from the gauge sector. And this was in, said to be the slogan, gravity should be the weakest force acting on those particles. In that sense, is gravity the weakest force acting on those particles? And um, in general, we have, since we are also talking about moduli situations with moduli, so we have mass of scalar fields, moduli is one of the topics of this workshop, of course. In physics, this means massless states. Massless states lead to these Yukawa interactions and hence to a modification. So these are the two versions of super extremality. They are not equivalent in general because of this extra Yukawa term, but in the limit of weak gauge coupling and certain asymptotic limits of the theory, we'll discuss this in much more detail, they are equivalent. Hence, we will mostly be talking about this, which is also closer to the topic or to the name weak gravity conjecture, but we have to be careful that in, inside the moduli space, they are not exactly. So this is the super extremality. And we said there should not only be some super extreme states, but there must be a tower. What do we mean by this? This means that there must be exists a super extreme particle of charge n times q for every charge q, where n should be some infinite set. So it could be, for example, for every q, there must be infinitely many particles. This would then be a lattice version of the weak gravity conjecture, or the whole sub the whole sub lattice should be populated. But more generally, it would be enough if some multiple n q for n and infinite set for every q. Um, is populated by, um, by weak So this is a lot of states. Infinitely many states must be there in such a in such a gravity. So I'm not going to talk about the motivation behind this. This, of course, is um, what led these authors a long time ago to, to propose this. There were considerations of black hole physics and of remnants in cosmology and things like that. So it's a purely motivated conjecture. But the nice thing is that one can translate this into statements about geometry whenever we um, um, take as an example the quantum gravity from M theory or, or string theory and translate those into statements about these numerative invariants that we can then prove or disprove. So, in fact, um, which types of states could occur? First of all, one knows that every BPS state is automatically super extremal or extremal. So, if you have a BPS state in your theory, then these states are automatically of the type that they satisfy this weak gravity condition. So in particular, if you have infinitely many BPS states in your theory and along a certain chart direction of charge lattice, you have infinitely many such states, then you're done. Then for that direction in charge lattice, the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. But what happens if no BPS tower exists in a certain direction in charge lattice? This can happen. And in fact, this is the generic situation. It's the generic situation, first of all, because in most theories, there does not exist such a thing as BPS state. In non supersymmetric theories, there are no BPS states. And even in theories with minimal supersymmetry, there are no BPS states. In six dimensional theories, for example, with minimal supersymmetry, there are no BPS particles. There are BPS strings, but not BPS particles. And the same is true in 4D n equal one theory with minimal supersymmetry. So BPS is very nice, but it's the non-generic situation, it's a luxury. And in fact, even in theories where you would have BPS states in principle, because you have 
eight superchargers, uh, so, uh, well, for example, 5D N equal one theory, there you do have PPS particles. And in some cases, this is enough to prove the weak gravity conjecture in certain directions because you can show a tower, but not in all. And this is what I'm going to discuss about. So what happens if these PPS states are not there? And this is the main result uh, formulated a bit more technically compared to the third slide. So let's specify. Let's take a laboratory. We are physicists. We make an experiment. Our laboratory is now M theory compactified on a Calabria 3 to be very specific. We get a theory in five dimensions. I'll discuss this for those who don't work on this in a second. What this means, what this jargon means. And the statement is suppose there is a direction in the charge letters that does not admit a tower of PPS particles. This can happen. Then one of the following is, 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 is true. Either there exists a super extremal tower of non BPS states. So we can find a tower of states, super extremal, so charge to mass, space, the condition, but the particles are not BPS. Or there is no recoupling limit for that gate. And we argue that um, this is then a matter of debate. We, we, we strongly believe that this means that the gravity conjecture is not even necessary to hold, but this is a different story. But the fact is that whenever there is no BPS tower at all, Either there is a non BPS tower, which we identify explicitly in full generality, or one cannot take a recoupling limit, meaning that the gauge group is always strongly coupled. This coupling is always at Planck scale. So it is debatable if the original argument leading to the weak gravity conjecture um, holds at all. And in this sense, we are going to establish the asymptotic tower weak gravity conjecture, meaning weak gravity means particle whose charge to mass ratio is bigger than that of a Planck hole. Tower means infinitely many. And asymptotic means in theories with the recoupling limit. So those theories that we as physicists would usually think of as controllable, perturbatively controllable gauge theory. The asymptotic tower with gravity conjecture, this can be shown in, in general. And to do this, we need to um, 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 uh, address more quantitatively these two um, specifications here. First, we need to think about, excuse me, um, we need to think about the asymptotic part, so theories with a recoupling limit. This means we need to go, we need to consider infinite distance limits in moduli spaces. In this case, moduli spaces of scalar manifolds, scalar color B or three folds. So this will be the first part to understand which in which regions of moduli space we have to look. And then we have to do the set state counting there. And this will be related to certain GBODT invariants, which by means of certain physics realities count also non-BPS state in the five-dimensional field that we will discuss. So that's the um, part for the talk. We first have to understand these decoupling limits and then talk about the state counting and then see if this physics conjecture is, is actually true. Okay, so um, I am trying to either avoid jargon or this will, I will not succeed. But I at least I'd, I'd like to explain the jargon to those who do not work on this topic a little bit. And if I fail to do so, please tell me right away so that I can explain what the jargon was supposed to mean. So I start first of all with the physical theory that we want to that we want to consider. So we said it's the compactification of M theory to five dimensions. What is meant by this? The physicists know all this. Apologies for the, to, the, to those, of course, but um, just to set the notation. So we start with this. With a theory in 11 dimensions. That's the supergravity theory in its long wavelength limit. So, a gravity theory in 11 dimensions. And the important input is that there is a three form gauge field in this 11 dimension theory. Um, so, this is like a gauge field, but with three form, three form indices. So, generalization of the job, or uh, however you want to think about it. This is where our gauge degrees of freedom will come from in a second. And what will be the particles or what will be the charged object? There are two types of charged objects in this 11 dimensional theory already. First, there are the famous membranes. These are two plus one dimensional objects. So they feel, have two spatial dimensions, one time dimension, and they couple to the three form simply by pulling back the three form to the world volume of the membrane. Hence, they are electrically charged under the three form. That's the jargon. And that's also a hot stool to the three forms, or more precisely, the 
a derivative of the three form has a Hodge dual in 11 dimension. That's the uh, um, derivative of the six form. The object that couples to this in the analogous fashion is called the M5 frame. That's a five spatial and one time direction. And both of these will be important. So the logic will be this will give rise to the BPS sector. And this will essentially be giving rise to the non BPS sector in a way that we will do this. Okay, so that was the starting point in 11 dimension. And now we, so that's the unique gravity theory or effective field theory of the, what one believes to be a unique gravity theory in 11 dimension. And now the usual game, we compactify this on a compact Calabria 3. So we think of our space time to be the direct product of one plus four dimensions times the compact Calabria 3 direction. And in this way, we arrive at, by looking at the low energy, at a theory in five dimensions. So in this R14, this is the effective field theory. It's super symmetric, so it has eight supercharges. Let's not worry about this. And this is a gravity theory, and it's a gauge theory. Where does the gauge increase the freedom? Where does the gauge bundle come from? Its connection is obtained by simply splitting the three form that we have in 11 dimensions in this fashion. So we um, take a certain basis of the two comma of the one comma one forms on the color real three, and we simply write C three as the sum of one form in R one form times two form in X three, and this way we get this one form which is which inherits the gauge degree of freedom of C three. So this is the gauge potential. Yes. That is uh, well because I'm on the color VR three. That's all I can do. So I can I can I can consider the three form in five dimensions, but that would be a different object. I can consider it. And the second possibility would be I take one leg in five and two legs in X three because um, at the if I want to think about harmonic form, so masses degrees of freedom, there are no one. Uh, I mean one comma zero of X three vanishes because it's color VR three. So that's the only option. So I want to, so there's also the three form, but this plays no role for, uh, for us now. I want to think about how do the usual gauge bundles or the connections on the gauge bundles come about in this language of, of complex. And, and this is how, 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 it, how it all is. Okay. And let me explain the second part. Again, uh, apologies to the physicists who know this very well. If we have this theory now in five dimensions, so we inherit the gravitational part, and we also inherit these gauge degree of freedom in the sense that we now have gauge, gauge groups here and um, the usual Young Mills theory and or, or U1 gauge theory. And there's a coupling, and this is important the coupling, I mean, the gauge coupling. This is determined now by dimensional reduction. It is essentially given by the structure of two form wedge star of the two form internally. And this is a, a certain combination of certain volumes. So the Keller geometry. Of the color VR threefold controls the coupling. What stands here is one over the coupling squared. So when this is large, then the coupling is small. So perturbative and recoupling means large F alpha beta, quote unquote, in a certain way. And this means large volumes. And which volumes? So these are volumes of certain devices and volumes of certain polymorph of certain curves on X. So that's the only message here. Controlling the couplings means controlling the color moduli of the color of the color wheel. Okay. Good. And um, what do we want? Let's just rem remember what we want to argue. We want to show, we want to check are there states, are there particles under these U1s that I get of certain charges, Q alpha? Uh, we don't know yet. So we want to, um, uh, uh, we want to check this. And we want to check if that charge to mass ratio satisfies a certain inequality, which was motivated by physics. This is the inequality. You don't need to look at the details. I just want to tell you that once the charges are known, this inequality is again a moduli dependent state because the masses of the state, whatever they are, they will also depend on the moduli. We will see in a second why. So um, this um, repulsive, that repulsiveness or super extremality condition in other contexts um, we can translate into uh, what it means in this effective field theory, and this simply will give us a certain inequality that is moduli dependent and that we have under control if we if if need to. Okay. So um, yeah, good. But this was just to to show that this can all be done explicitly. Um, the, the details we don't need to. Do. Okay. So now, which so we we talked about the gauge potentials. 
what about now the particle? Wh which type of state could there be? So the first idea and first source of potential states that would satisfy this constraint would be the BPS particles. We said this already, BPS particles are known to always be extremal or super extreme. And which, which are candidates for BPS particles in the five dimensional theory, they come from these M2 brains. Recall two slides ago, we had an 11 dimension, two plus one dimensional objects, these membranes to which C3 coupled. Now, how do we get a particle of them in five dimensions? Again, by splitting the world volume in a similar way, we say, the time direction D in R14, sorry, R14, not R15, and the, uh, the remaining spatial two directions D along uh, the internal manifold. So the jargon is we wrap the membrane on a curve. You all not know this because you, keep you all know how to compute G, uh, GV invariants and some of Wittmann invariants and to count certain states. And these are the states that you know how to compute. Um, so these are particles and they have charges. Why? Because the original object, the membrane, was coupling to the three form. The gauge field is just the descendant of this in five dimensions. So the charge is just computed by um, uh, um, um, plugging this into here, this decomposition. Very simple, of course. The charge is then given in terms of an intersection product between a certain divisor and the curve. So this is the topological number from the And the mass of these particles, turns out, is given by the volume of the curve because the original object had a certain tension, you put it on a, on, a, uh, on a curve and then the volume gives the mass. And the volume of the curve is something that is controlled by Keller geometry. And hence we are again in this business that the Keller geometry tells us everything about not only the charges, these are here the intersection numbers, but also the mass. And in particular, if the curve is holomorphic, then the particle is BPS. And then as we said, it's either extremal or super extremal and we are in business. Therefore, the first question is, does there in every direction of charge letters exist infinitely many a tower of BPS particles? Or put differently, if you take a fixed holomorphic curve class, is it true that there exists infinitely many multiples of this curve class such that the Romofitten invariant or rather the group of buffer invariant for this curve class is non-zero? That is a well-defined question to ask. And the answer is no, this is not true, as you know very well. However, what is true is that certain curve classes have this property. Namely, if you take curve classes in the movable cone of your color VR3, then it was conjectured by Murad and friends that for those, the following is true. The genus, excuse me, the genus zero, I summed a bit to this, the genus zero, Gopakuma buffer invariant, for any multiple n times this homomorphic this curve class in the movable cone is non vanishing That is a conjecture. And let me recall for you, or let me recall, you know this better than I do, that the movable curve cone is the cone of curves dual to the cone of effective devices. So on this color there three, we have the cone of effective devices, the dual cone, if the movable cone, uh, movable cone. Movable because they essentially can move freely in the color of three, or you can have a family that fills out the entire color. So this is not a proven statement, but it's a conjecture. It um, has been confirmed in an overwhelming number of examples of compact color of three folds in these two papers. And there's also good reason why this should hold, because as also discussed by Murat and friends, for those curved classes, the associated particles are such that they are BPS, and the BPS condition is the same as the black hole extremality condition, it turns out. This is a non-trivial statement. They show this by um, a PPS flow. And they show that um, for, for these curves in the movable cone, um, there always exists a nice endpoint of the flow and that in fact the BPS condition equals the B, uh, extremality condition, which is not always true when you have scalar flow. So therefore it is expected that also since the black hole exists, also the particle should exist um, and hence the invariant should be non -zero. So this is an interesting project by itself to try and prove this from a purely mathematical point of view while, while, while this is. While this. But we are going to ask a different question. The remaining challenge therefore is, what if there are no BPS powers? And generically, this is the case because there are many examples 
of course, the movable co uh, uh, cone it does not exhaust the class of uh, does not exhaust the um, uh, um, um, not 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 every not every element in H two is inside the movable cone, obviously. So there are many directions where this simple solution or this solution to the free gravity conjecture does not hold. And the simplest example would be the conifold. Um, if you have a conifold, um, a two cycle that you just slow down and use the conifold transition, um, then clearly the, uh, the GV invariant for one times this curve is one, but for any positive multiple thereof is zero. So in this direction, in charge letters, you do not have a BPS power at all. So the question is, why is this? And does, the, does this invalidate the tower with gravity conjecture or what's the situation? That's what we would like. That's the question of. And the main result, I repeat it again. Whenever there is no such BPS tower, for example, as for the conifold or many other cases, then either one can instead find a non BPS tower from a different source of particles, and this is related to a different type of invariance. We'll come to this. Or the U1 is always strongly coupled, meaning that we can never take an asymptotic limit in which this U1 gauge group is uh, a nice weakly coupled theory. And hence, we would claim. Um, it is plausible that the original physics arguments don't hold, but this is, this is another thing. But these these two are these two are. Possible. And again, let me repeat so that we you, you remember uh, what we want to do. We first, therefore, need to um, consider all weak coupling limits by looking at the Keller geometry, and we are going to show that in all weak coupling limits, we will find these super extremal powers, either of BPS type or of non BPS. So we're going to prove this just coming from the other uh, other side. Everything that has a coupling limit will be proven to satisfy with the gravity. Okay, question so far? Um, exactly, exactly. So you, you pick a certain linear combination of your one, and or, or put differently, if a curve is charged under, uh, uh, has, has a charge under, certain, under, under, under a certain linear combination of your one, such that a multiple times this charge does not uh, admit these, non -BPS, uh, these BPS states, then this linear combination can never become weakly coupled, or instead you can find a non-BPS that does the same. That's the claim. Okay, so now I need to do two things. I really want to get here, but I first have to start there because otherwise, I guess this is how we how we have to attack the problem. We attack the problem in the recoupling limit. So we need to understand what the recoupling limits are. But this we can do. Why? Because let me recall, recoupling limit means recoupling means. So we have our Lagrangian. We have a gauge coupling. This is inverse gauge coupling squared, one over G squared. So recoupling means G small. This means F large. F is essentially a linear combination of volumes. So we need to consider the limits in which volumes under the Calabria 3 become large. However, we have to do so at fixed overall volume. The total volume of the Calabria 3 must remain constant. Because to be more precise, the gauge coupling is a normalized volume. So it's volume of devices divided by suitable powers of the volume of the total Calabria. So scaling everything up does not help at all. If I just make the Calabria larger, this makes these volumes larger, but also this volume larger, so this doesn't help. So we are mathematically interested in the infinite distance limits in Keller moduli space at fixed overall Keller volume. Full stop. That's what we need to. That's what we need to. Have. And indeed, that's what I just said. And but that's only a necessary condition for the decoupling limit. The um, and these entries here have to go to infinity because this is one over coupling squared. So these are these infinite distance limits in Keller moduli space at fixed overall volume. But this is now something that only probably the physicists will appreciate. This is only necessary. It's not sufficient. Why is it not sufficient? It's a bit hard to explain. The point is. Just because the coupling goes to zero, this does not yet mean that the theory really becomes weakly coupled relative to gravity. So we need to consider the, the, the relation between essentially the coupling strength for the gauge sector and the coupling strength of gravity. And that should be small. That is the precise criterion. And um, our proposal is that we must consider the following object. This is, uh, apologies, this is now a, a, a physics statement, but it's very important because otherwise we would not be able to, to show this theorem. Um, the gauge coupling squared times the Planck scale, this is what tells us about the, uh, the gravitational coupling. This has to be small compared to 
the cutoff scale of the quantum gravity. The cutoff scale of the quantum gravity is the scale where the one loop corrections in the to the Einstein Hilbert term in, in gravity become comparable to the tree level term. So where the perturbative um, quantum gravity, uh, the perturbative effective field theory of gravity breaks down. It's a perturbative gravity. And this um, is a quantity that has been discussed in great detail in the physics literature. It goes back to uh, first to Dwali and, um, um, and has been um, a, a lot of papers studying this um, because it's so important and it's called the species. So for the mathematicians, just think about that we have a certain recoupling limit, a certain asymptotic limit in Taylor moduli space, plus another constraint to check that comes from the physics. And for the physicists, it's the statement that we have to relate the gauge coupling to actually the cut off of your quantum gravity. And this is very important because this will go to zero as well in the limit. And hence, we really need to make sure that the ratio goes to zero and not just the numerator. OK, so let's characterize first the recoupling limits, and then we come to the state count. Which recoupling limits can occur? So as we said, a necessary condition is that we look at these infinite distance limits in Keller moduli space at fixed volume, fixed overall vol overall volume. And these one can classify. We classified them together with Wolfgang and Sonju some time ago. And they can be classified in this way. Such limits can, uh, can be obtained either if your color Biao has a um, T2 vibration, a genus one vibration, need not be elliptic, but at least genus one vibration, or it admits a K3 vibration or an abelian surface vibration, a T4 vibration. T, this should be a T4, not a T4. K3 or T4. And so this is a topological criterion for a color of 3 to admit an infinite distance limit in Keller moduli space at fixed volume. And when this topological condition is satisfied, then the limits always look like this. In the first case, the volume of the base goes to infinity. Let's call the scaling lambda. And the volume of the fiber goes to zero, just inverse, so that the total volume stays finite. And similarly, on the K3 or T4 vibration side, the volume of the base goes to infinity and the one of the fiber goes to zero. So the only Calabria 3 with an interesting recoupling limit or with an interesting infinite distance limit in Keller moduli space must admit these vibrations. And this is very nice because many people here in the room are interested in vibrations of either of these two types for completely different reasons. And the statement is, these are the only relevant cases if you ever want to study a weakly coupled gauge theory in MC. All the other ones that do not enjoy this are not relevant. Second, these are the ones that have been studied for ages in string theory because they admit nice dual duality frames. And this is where these duality, why these dualities are relevant because they automatically come when we want to think about weakly coupled gauge theory. So this is a very general statement that I think puts the importance of these vibrations into a very physical context and explains why they, why they are. Yeah. What the feature, what, so general vibrations, mathematically or physically? Um, no special feature. Uh, G, uh, an arbitrary genus one vibration need not be need not be uh, elliptic, and an arbitrary K three or T four vibration need not have sections or, or it. All color BR vibrations do the job exactly. All all the color BR vibrations. The fiber dimension you mean? Conflict. Um, ramified double cover, a uh, uh, ramified double cover. Oh. No, 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 thank you. No, absolutely not. Uh, the, the dimension must be positive. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, no, th this is just a discrete structure. Um, here I'm interested in really taking an asymptotic uh, uh, limit in the mod in the in the smooth model, I said. In the in the model. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's only these. Okay, so the claim is these are the only ones that admit a recoupling limit. And now so for, for these, um, something interesting happens that again is clear to the physicist. Suppose we take such a limit. Let's, let's look at this first object. How much time do I have? Okay. 
15 more minutes. Okay, good. I thought I would be much faster. Anyway, let, let, let's discuss this. What happens in this limit? The base becomes large, large, the pi becomes small. So what happens now in physics? In physics, we, we said we have these two brains, two plus one dimension brains. We can wrap an M2 brain on this fiber. This gives a particle. When the fiber becomes small, the particle becomes light. We can wrap it infinitely many times because the chromophyton invariance of any copy, positive copy of the torus fiber is non-zero. This is the general result that you can show with the Lefschetz, Lefschetz, Lefschetz theory or other means. So this is always gives rise to infinitely many particles wrapped once, wrapped twice, for, so for, associated with every multiple of the torus fiber gets the GD invariant. It gives a particle of volume the torus when this goes to zero, lambda goes to infinity in the limit, um, you get infinitely many massless particles. They are BPS. What is the role of these particles? From a physics point of view, all you see that you get many, many light particles. When you put uh, uh, when you switch on your collider, you will find many, many particles. You don't know where they come from, but they come at equidistance in the mass. The mass of the second particle is twice the mass of the first. And this means that these particles behave like kaluza klein states. This means that effectively a new dimension in physics opens up. This is a decompactification limit from five dimensions to six dimensions. And you end up with a theory in six dimensions in which the torus is gone, and this defines your, your compactification. This is, of course, the well-known F theory limit. And the quantum gravity scale here for the physicist is, of course, just the Planck scale in one dimension, which goes to zero compared to the original Planck scale. So this has to be taken into account. More interesting is the second type. And the nice thing is that that's not it. That's the only thing. The second type, what happens now? Now a surface fiber goes to zero volume. What can happen in particular? Recall we also have these five brains. These are five plus one dimensional objects. So I can now take four of these dimensions along the surface fiber. Then I have two dimensions left, space and time. These two dimensions are put into my space time, the non compact time, and I get a string. I get a string whose which becomes light, the tension of that string is the volume of the fiber, it's small, it goes to zero. And since this is the Calabriau, since the fiber is Calabriau, the string that I get is either a critical heterotic string or type two string. It's also been known for ages in the physics literature. But if this were a P2 fiber or any a, a non calabriau fiber, this would not be true. But in this way, I get a new string, heterotic of type two or type two string, whose tension goes to zero, it becomes smaller than any other scale. So my emergent theory at uh, infinite distance is that of a new type of string theory, heterotic or type two string. So I started with an M theory, the word string has not been used, but at, in this limit, I end up with a string theory. So this is the reason why string theories are important from that point of view, because they naturally appear at one of the two possible ways how to go to the coupling and that infinite distance. And the quantum gravity scale in this case is the species scale associated with that string, and we have to compare everything to that. And by the way, there's a conjecture. Um, so this is an example where this happens, and the conjecture is this, this emergent string conjecture that it all that is always that this is completely general that every infinite distance limit in every moduli space of every color BR always either leads to something like this, the deconvexification, or to an emergent new string theory. You compared to the original theory that you found. Okay, so now we've understood the recoupling limit, the possible recoupling, the, po the possible infinite distance limit. What now remains to understand is which gauge groups in this five dimensional theory become weakly coupled in these limits, because for these we want to check the re gravity convention. And this is what we, what we did more recently. We classified them, and the statement is very simple again. The only ones which can ever become weakly coupled are of one of the following two types. Namely, when you take a linear combination of U1, you can think of this as being associated with the curve class. Why? I mean, the, the easiest way would be think of a three form. We had a three form, C3. I can integrate the three form over a curve, then I have one leg le left, and that's my one form. So to every U1, to every linear combination of U1, I get a curve. And the curves associated with the U1, which can become weakly coupled in one of these two limits, are of the following type. Either it's the torus fiber itself, and only the full torus fiber, so no 
degenerate components, no exceptional curves inside the torus fiber, only the generic fiber, or the curve is the curve inside a generic K3 or T4 fiber, meaning those fibers that are um, uh, uh, that can occur at finite distance in the complex structure moduli space of, um, of, the, um, of the fiber. So what I do not want is curves that are localized only in say type two or type three Kulikov type fibers, uh, K3 fibers that could occur. These will not lead to the, the weekly couple gauge theories, but all the other ones, the ones that I can deform everywhere, these will lead to the uh, one uh, to, uh, to um, weekly couple theory. So um, I, I, we have now complete control over all the potentially weakly coupled gauge groups. They are either always associated with the torus fiber or with essentially a generic curve in a K3 or T4 fiber. That's the claim. And to show this one has to look at all possible degenerations and, uh, and look at the intersection form in these degenerate cases, but that's the other. Yeah. Okay, so now, now I'm done. Now I want to check the weak gravity conjecture. Now I want to ask, for these you ones, are there BPS towers? And if not, are there at least non-BPS towers? We could start with the first case. The first case, are there BPS towers? And this is very simple. The answer is yes. Of course, there are BPS particles charged under this U1. Namely, the BPS towers are just given by M2 brains wrapping the torus fiber themselves. These are particles. There's infinitely many because we already said that the torus fiber has any multiple of the torus fiber has non-zero uh, GB invariant. Hence, there's a tower. And these particles are precisely the ones that are charged under this corresponding U1. The U1 is the dual divisor, so it would be the section or the multi-section, which you always have. Um, so this is precisely the combination of the charge. And everything else, every other curve, will be charged under the U1 that cannot become weakly coupled. And hence, we um, do not care if there's a BPS or non-BPS. So those that are weakly coupled, of, um, that can become charged under something weakly coupled, so this there is BBS power. So that's the boring case, and I'm clipping the technical for The interesting case is now the one of the vibration, of the, of the surface vibration. And I'm only going to discuss the K3 case, for, again, for reasons. So what's the remaining question? Suppose a Carl-Lavier 3 admits the K3 vibration, then we already said the only U1 which can undergo a recoupling limit is of the type that it corresponds to compactifying, to, to reducing the three form C3 over a curve, which is part of the generic K3 fiber, or can be deformed into a generic K3 fiber. And um, indeed, one can check that these curves, that, that the associated U1 satisfy the statement, um, and also this more complicated physics statement. Um, that the gauge coupling becomes small compared to, compared to that. So now I need to check, finally, what, what, are, what are the, uh, do, do I have, do I have PPS towers? Do I have super extreme? So now we are in the realm that many people here have been working on extensively. Um, namely, we need to um, think about um, the letters, the, the letters of curves inside here, the generic K3 fiber. And as you all know very well, this letters over the reals can be decomposed into self dual and enter self dual parts of positive and negative self intersection. And this is a lattice of rank one comma R where R is not larger than 19 in the generic case. So I now wonder, are there particles that I can get by wrapping M2 brains on other on certain curves inside here, any curves that would satisfy the weak gravity condition? And, if, and then I want to and the statement is this depends on the self intersection of the curve that I look at. If the self intersection is non negative, then a BPS tower exists, meaning the GB invariant for any multiple of that curve is non zero. First of all, as a check, such curves are indeed movable. They are movable inside the K3. If the self intersection is non negative, they can move inside the K3. And they can also, since the K3 moves over the P1, they move therefore in the entire X, in the entire color of three. So they satisfy this conjecture of, of Murad and friends. They are in the movable cone, hence you would expect them to admit a power of BPS particles. And this is well known, has been known for, for a long time because the BPS index is counted by a, um, um, a modular form. Um, more precisely, the number of a, uh, the, the, the GV invariance at genus zero of a curve C 
is given by this coefficient the n where n is two squared over two. So as long as this is non-negative, this is the coefficient is non-zero. And not only is it non-zero for one times the curve, but also for any positive multiple of the curve as well. So here we have a BPS power and the weak gravity conjecture is done. However, generically we have these curves c squared of negative self-intersection as well. These curves are rigid in the case of fiber. They are not in the movable cone. Therefore, we do not expect a BPS power. And there is also no BPS power. But this is now the claim. In this case, a tower of non-BPS states, states takes over. And these states come not from the M2 brains, but from this other source of states that we could potentially look at, namely from the M5 brain. More precisely, we can now consider the following object once more. We wrap the M5 brain now on the fiber. This gives us a string in five dimensions. Not just any string, but since it's the K3, it's a heterotic string. So it's a very special string, it's a critical string. This critical string has excitations. The excitations of this uh, string are charged under the gauge group. And the claim is there are always some states that are super extremal. This we need to show, and there's infinitely many. So this is what we need to show. And in order to show this, we have to translate the counting problem of counting the excitations of this string that you get by wrapping and five on the curve into accounting of BPS invariance of uh, Donaldson Thomas type of on on uh, on in, in the context of type 2a string theory on the same color Biao. And um, this was discussed in detail by um, uh, people in the room in particular let me let me um, point out uh, these two papers. So more precisely I'm translating now this problem of counting String excitation to counting um, BPS invariance. Those of you who have worked on this know this very well. Let me just review um, how this works. We have this M theory on Calabria 3. Uh, this is a theory in five dimensions. Now we put this theory on another circle. So I go effectively to four dimensions. What I can now consider is the following state. I can consider a bound state of this M5 brain wrapping the fiber, the signal string. This string can wrap many times on the um, on the S1, and I can also have what the physicists call KK momentum, so waves along the along the string, and I can bound it to the particles that I got by wrapping M2 brains on any curve, any curve in the lattice of the case. And this is known to be equivalent under under a certain string theory, uh, string theory duality to um, the uh, object counted by dt invariance and the d4 dt is your bound state or um, object counted by a coherent sheaf with these charges r times r for the uh, wrapping number times the um, um, class of the k3 q of the class of the curve and n the class of h0 and copies of h0 so to speak that would be the d0 bound. this is a well-known duality and equivalently, you can think of these states as being the winding modes, winding and KK modes of a heterotic string that you get by compactifying M5 brain on the state scene at the KK level N and with charge vectors. And okay, so far so good. And now the important point is, in this special case where R is one, so where you wrap only once, you can identify this KK number for the states in four dimensions with the excitation level of the heterotic string. This is because the KK and the excitation level in string theory always appear in the same fashion. So when I know that a certain state in four dimensions exists at a certain KK level, then this means that if I go to five dimensions, I don't wrap the string, but I keep stay in five dimensions, that the same state, same charges exist at a certain excitation level of the string. This is only true for the heterotic string with R equal one, because this is a critical string. In general, this would not be. These states in five dimensions are non-BPS. And hence, they must be non-BPS because we've already shown there are no BPS states that would do the job. So these states have a chance to be super extremal and they are counted by BPS states in one dimension law. So these can be counted by DC invariance. This way we get non-BPS string excitation one dimension higher. And we now need to do two things. First, we need to show that there is a tower for these, a tower of a certain type with a relation between the excitation level or KK number, depending on how you want to view it, and the charge. We call this is Q squared negative, so this is positive. And then we need to show that they are super extremal. And then finally, we have. So let's first 
quickly and 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 being fast now. Let, let me um, speed up. First, we have to show that these states exist. So the claim is there are special states at uh, kk number n and with, in which, where the kk number is equal to this charge, or if you think about the teen variance, where this n is minus one half g squared, so these are teen variance. These always exist, that's the claim, and they are supergenic. That they always exist, we know by um, looking at the counting problem. Um, the same statement that I just made um, more formally just means that the elliptic genus of the heterotic string is related to, um, can, can be written um, as this uh, linear combination of um, a generating function for the S numbers and um, these uh, um, Siegel, uh, uh, Siegel type forms here. The BPS numbers, these four DPPS numbers um, are counted by this um, DT invariant. And we now need to show that for precisely when n plus q squared over two is zero, that then the corresponding omega gamma is non zero. Then we have those things. And this follows from the observation that was made very clear in this paper in particular, um, uh, and I'm going looking at a special case, the paper is much more general, that the, um, the generating function for the DT invariance um, has this nice form in the specific case, K3 with R equal one of this um, eta minus 24 times um, a vector value modular form that counts essentially or whose, in, uh, whose coefficients are related um, to the neuter Lefschetz numbers and you can show that precisely when n plus q squared over two is zero, so that when the corresponding Mr. Lefschetz number would have to be zero as well, that then the um, BPS state is, uh, the BPS number is non-zero and the state. So this counting problem has been solved already. We just need to, need to put it together. And now what's left for us to do is to show that the state, this, this, this tower of states. So tower meaning if I, I take the charge Q negative, then I can always find an N such that um, a state exists. And of course, any multiple of Q also exists because I just uh, multiply then N by the corresponding multiple of N. Hence, I have a tower. And what we need now to show that this tower is in fact super extremal, it satisfies the physics conjecture. Um, so we have to look at this form of self-repulsiveness um, condition. We have to look at the specific states. And this we can do with the help of string theory. We know what the masses of states are at a certain expectation level. There are a number of technical complications because we work in five dimensions. So um, we have to take into account Coulomb parameters, et cetera. But the, when the dust settles, one can show that in the asymptotic limit for weak coupling, everything just cancels that was causing trouble. And miraculously, the states just satisfy the reflexivity conjecture. So it's, everything falls into places, but only for those states. And these are the only ones generally that do the job. So we wrap up with the final statement. Yes, here it is. So we've shown the um, asymptotic version of the weak gravity conjecture of the total gravity conjecture in five dimensions. Similar statements can be made in other theories without non dps states, namely in six dimensions and in four dimensions, particularly for the um, minimally supersymmetric ones here. Quantum corrections play an important role that we also looked at. I discussed the K3 story. The T4 story will go the same way, but it would be very nice to understand them better from the counting point of view. Um, um, this may be something we can talk about later. And now for the uh, physicists, it's a nagging conceptual question. What now if there's no tower in a certain direction? Well, what we know now is this is only then the case when the U1 cannot become weakly coupled. But you could still ask that should the Greek gravity conjecture not be satisfied nonetheless? This is an ongoing debate. We have some opinion on this and hopefully um, contribute more to the discussion. And for now, thank you very much. Thanks for the Is there any quick question for the speaker? Yes. Um, okay, any good two. So for example, Heterotic on T4. No, I would I would assume that the same, I would assume that the heterotic on T4. Yes, I think everything would be okay. Because this is heterotic on T4, right? No, 5D, 5D any good two. On uh heterotic on T4. I'll have to think about it. I'll, I'll have to think about it. I would think so. I, I would I would I would I would guess yes. Because they would always be interpretable. There would, would always be a BPS tower that could be a KK tower. 
all string excitations now. Huh? So my guess would be that it always works. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I would think so. Uh, I don't want to make a definite statement. My guess would be yes. Let me, let me think more. Perfect. So let me take the opportunity before thanking the speaker also to thank for this very nice, wonderful conference to Simone, Chuck, and Johannes. Let's thank the organizer. Uh, let's also give a quick thanks to Sebastian. <laughs> there is a lunch, yes, it's already cooling. But...